these buildings. Invest in that truck, too, at his production. With tractors and trucks, with electricity and all the modern tools that multiply the productivity of a load of calves. Take me half a day to get over there and back. With and all day if you had to walk. Yeah, I could. How'd you like to farm the way your grandfather did? You mean with no truck, no tractor, no electricity? Could you? Not alone, I couldn't. I'd have to have a couple of hired hands. Even then, I don't know as I could handle this land. Then modern tools make a big difference. Well, I doubt if we could feed 155 million people without them. I suppose your wife feels that. Why don't you go ask her? Well, thank you. We will. Pardon us. We're trying to find out something about the importance of tools in modern life. That sewing machine, for instance. <laughs> I couldn't live without it. Are you fairly self-sufficient on a farm like this? Well, I... What do you mean? Your husband could butcher a steer? Oh, yes. But could either one of you make up of the hide? Choose? Well, I doubt it. Could you shear a sheep? Wash the wool, cart it, spin the thread, and weave cloth for, say, a wool shirt. I don't know any woman today who could. How about food? Could you get along without your modern kitchen, without refrigeration? You mean salting things, pickling, and poking, and so on. Well, I suppose I could, but I wouldn't want to go back to that kind of life. I'll take my kitchen and plenty of hot water and electricity and all that goes with it. <laughs> Makes all the difference in the world. Thank you. In other words, for both men and women, tools multiply what we can do and push us closer to a better, more comfortable life. This is true anywhere we look. With modern tools, the modern farmer can supply food and fiber for 50 from the land. The workers who built that trip the kitchen or do the important jobs in medicine or education. You're looking at a capitalist. He may not think of his tools as capital goods, but that's what they are. The only reason he saves and invests in capital goods is because he expects them to pay for themselves in use. He wants to make a profit. That's his privilege in this country. In some countries, the state owns all. In this country, we have the great gift of freedom, and most of our capital goods are privately owned. You realize what a difference tools make when you know that pioneer miners with hand tools couldn't put out a ton of coal in a long working day. Even today, European miners, using some machinery, put only up to two tons on the surface. Contrast this with what we can do with better tools. On the average, American miners put out seven tons, and with really modern tools, some mines produce 10 to 15 tons for each man each day. Let's take another example. In 1839, William Underwood made 10 canisters by hand. He could turn out about six an hour. They were so expensive that they were saved and reused many times. Today, one automatic machine can produce more than 20,000 per hour, and they cost so little they're used by millions. It's this kind of progress that provides us with the rising standard of living which makes us the envy of the world. Let's put it this way. Hand tools are better than no tools at all. Animal power is better than no power at all. It's slow and laborious, but saving and investing is slow and laborious too. Yet that's where new and better tools come from. In the first 40 years of this century, we improved our tools, and each man hour per year produced 2% more. Since 1939, we have improved our tools faster and have increased our real income almost 3% per man hour per year. Capital goods include anything that helps us do more with less effort. Hand tools, machine tools, power tools. You have to include the buildings, the mills, the factories. You have to include the barn, the silo, the roads and highways. You include things like the wires that carry electricity, the telephone system, all the public utilities, the street, the sidewalks. You have to include school buildings too, the playground, all the necessary facilities. 
A great deal of money had to be saved and invested just to supply us with so much in the way of capital goods. Just look down any street and you can see a hundred examples of what we're talking about. Public projects, private enterprise, wherever you look. But where do they all come from? Can anybody get in the act? Or is it the special privilege of the few? Well, let's see. In order to have capital goods, there must be savings. If we used up everything we produce, if we spent every dollar we got hold of, then there would be no savings. But most of us don't do that. This is one of many institutions where people put their savings. You can go in here if you want to and start a savings account or a checking account. And because in every community there are so many savers, their savings are pooled and available for use. These savings may be loaned to this farmer for a carload of steers, to finance a new tractor, to build a new corn crib. All across the country, the savings of many other individuals are accumulating and made available to help a merchant with his inventory to meet a payroll at a factory. And while this is going on, people are saving through other institutions. Most life insurance policies, for example, include a savings feature. And this is only one instance of a great many kinds of thrift plans. Four out of five of us save in one way or another. And our accumulated savings are invested in public projects and in private enterprise. But some of us have an adequate life insurance program. We have a rainy day fund in a savings account and still have some surplus funds. Where do we put these funds? We want to be paid for their use and we want them in a sound, useful or productive investment. For instance, a widow of a successful businessman, the chairman of a pension fund, a dentist, a skilled workman, a successful farmer. Who needs and who will pay for the use of their savings? Well, a typical example would be an electric light and power company. They face a growing demand for current. Within a few years, they must supply electricity than their present plants and equipment can furnish. So, they need funds to meet the growing demand. Funds that will become capital goods. A gas company needs to finance a new pipeline. An oil company needs a new cat cracker. A steel company needs to expand. If they can't save all the money out of earnings, where will it come from? From time to time, cities need money to build a new bridge or enlarge the waterworks. A city will need money for the new hospital. Where do new streets or highways come from? Let's see how people do find the funds to invest in capital goods. Sometimes they do it themselves. This is just a one-man shop. I didn't have to borrow from anybody. I used to be a carpenter, but I don't like to work for other people, so I started this little business on my own. You saved your own money? Well, I borrowed a little from a friend on a note, but I paid it off. Thank you. Ed and I met over in the Pacific during the war. We're both pretty good mechanics, so we just pooled our dough, became partners, and went to work. You haven't had to borrow money? Nope, not yet. But we are figuring on expanding. I think we can raise the money right around here without much trouble. Thank you. It's easy to see how the savings of individuals, friends and neighbors get into productive use. But how about the larger plant that needs the savings of many individuals? If they're successful, there comes a time when they need further funds for expansion. Here's a good example. A successful business. Here is Mr. Gray, who is considering this typical problem. Well, this is the first time we're raising money by selling securities to the public. We've had some discussions with an investment banker, and I'm about to dictate a letter to him. Do you mind if we listen in? Not at all. Dear Mr. Bradley, our company has considered the plan you outlined to raise money for our expansion through the sale of common and preferred stocks. We would like to discuss ways and means with you at your earliest convenience. Usual close. Mr. Gray, would you mind explaining how you expect to raise this money? Certainly not. Here on the one hand, there are millions of savers. And over here is our company. 
we need the use of some of these savings. We want more plant, they want to invest, and we're willing to pay for the use of their savings. This calls for a specialist, someone who can funnel these savings into our plant and into other useful projects. The middleman, the specialist, is called an investment banker. Well, how is an investment banker different from a commercial bank? Well, a commercial bank is a bank of deposit, a place where we may uh, keep our savings and uh, have checking accounts. It accepts funds for safekeeping and may lend me money to meet my payroll or for some other temporary use. A short-term lender. Yes, that's right. But an investment banking house is not a bank of deposit. It's concerned with long-term investments. You know, securities, stocks and bonds. Investment bankers are merchants. They buy the securities of a corporation needing funds for expansion, for additional tools, or other business purposes. The corporation thus gets the funds immediately. Then the investment banker sells the securities to investors. If you want more information about this, why don't you ask an investment banker? Thank you, Mr. Gray. We'll do that. Right now. Why, yes, I'm an investment banker. My name is Bradley. There's no mystery about securities. Let me see if I can give you a very simple explanation. Why do people buy them? Because they want a higher return than they can get through other sound uses of savings. In general, there are two types, bonds and stocks. Now, here are some bonds. These are something like a promissory note. A bond is simply a legal form representing a loan for a fixed length of time at a fixed regular income called interest. The money paid for these bonds went into a municipal waterworks. It might have been for any similar project. Anybody can buy this or any of the other securities we handle. If you're a saver and want to lend your money this way, you buy a bond and get interest. Or you may want to become part owner of a business, in which case you can buy stock. Stock is another legal form. It represents a share of ownership of a business and, through dividends, a share in the profits. So you see, you can become either a lender or a part owner of a business through owning securities. If you own stock, you actually own a share of the facilities, the capital goods. And this type of ownership may be of two kinds. The preferred stock is entitled to a stated dividend, which must be paid before any dividends are paid on the common. In contrast, dividends on the common can fluctuate with the times. If you're investing your money, you want to be paid for the use of your money. But the type of investment you make varies, depending on your objective, your aims and requirements. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Through these securities, bonds and stocks, you supply the long-term investment funds that are needed by government to build the bridge or by industry to expand the plant. Yes, now Mr. Gray's company is a fine example of private enterprise needing funds. Can anyone, any business, say, come to you for funds? Certainly, and if it's a sound organization, we'll do everything we can to help. There's an element of risk in everything. How do you determine a sound investment? I think I can show you better than trying to tell you. Take this example at hand, Mr. Gray. Here's how we approach it. This job calls for specialists. And here is the way the men in our buying department go to work. We have a considerable staff of experts in this department. Our first step is to find out if the new securities would represent a sound and desirable use of funds. In other words, these men are asked, is this a good instrument? We check the firm's reputation, its credit standing. We study financial reports and other statistics. We visit their plant and study their record over a period of years. We appraise the management. And once we get enough information, we put it on the table and talk it over. We're very thorough and very careful. We have a responsibility in buying and merchandising any securities. If we feel justified in going ahead, we will so notify, in this case, Mr. Gray. And then we really go to work. We review the quality of the management, the history of the company, the physical assets, the location of the plant and the plant itself the character of the products, the market, and how they stand against competition. How about labor relations, public relations and goodwill? How about their financial statements for a period of years? How about their current earnings, future outlet, 
prospects and so forth. Our invest and industry analysts check the facts on this particular company and make comparisons with other corporations in the same industry. We try to estimate not only present, but future needs. In making our appraisal, we call in public accountants, attorneys, industrial engineers, and other specialists. We make comparative earnings statements, check balance sheets, look into maintenance charges and depreciation. It all adds up to a report like this, which gives us a comprehensive analysis of this particular company. We know enough now to recommend in this case that the company go ahead and issue the securities at a stated price. And we agree, acting as principals, to purchase the new securities, or as we say, to underwrite this issue. Next, we file a registration statement on these securities with a governmental agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission. They examine it. And not until they declare the registration effective may we sell these securities to the public. Then we give our check to the corporation, which means the funds can be put to work at once. This means expanded facilities, new jobs, and our national productivity will soon be increased by just this much of new manufacturing power. In the meantime, we're in this position. You might say that we've bought these securities wholesale, but we still have to sell them. Where do you get the money for this purpose? We've invested our own funds, and we may have borrowed part of the money on a short-term loan from a commercial bank. Now it's up to us to sell the securities to investors, our customers. You can begin to understand our deep feeling of responsibility, which will last as long as the securities exist. There are other investment bankers and security dealers, hundreds of them, scattered in the principal centers around the country. We may share the offering with others. Sometimes national distribution is desirable. Sometimes it doesn't matter. We may sell them locally. In underwriting an issue, that is, in buying securities, we're acting as owners or principals. Then we turn to our sales department to merchandise the securities, to sell them to sellers who may be looking for just this kind of an investment. It is the sales department that links the users of funds, the individual company on the one hand, and the many investors on the other. The problem of securing distribution of an issue, placing the bonds or stocks in the hands of investors, calls for expert training, high professional standards, and a thorough knowledge of this important subject. Character, integrity, and a realistic working knowledge are all necessary for this kind of selling. Each individual investor has his own special needs and problems. It's up to us to help in any way we can, with information, with analysis, with prompt and practical service as he decides to buy or sell securities. I bought these stocks about five years ago, but I'm building a home. I want you to sell them for me. They pay dividends right along, but I need the money. Oh, yes. We'll be pleased to sell these for you. I'll take care of this right now. It was so nice of you to come out to the house again. Why, I'm glad to do it. We were all shocked to hear about your husband. Yes, I told him to slow down, but he just couldn't. It was his heart, you know. Yes. I know Sam would want me to consult with you about the problem of investing my money. You see, with the insurance, I have quite a sum that ought to be invested. Suppose we begin with an estimate of your requirements. We'll have to think about your plans for your children. Let's see. Well, Bill is married, but Tommy's still in school. Uh-huh. Well, you'll probably want to keep the house until Tommy finishes. Oh, yes, of course. After all, the mortgage is small. Yes. I'm chairman of the pension fund of this corporation. We're looking for a well-diversified list of high-quality bonds and some common stocks. They must be high-grade, and they must fit into our basic plan. I've been practicing for about five years. My office is clear, and I'm out of debt. And I'm all right as regards insurance and so on program that'll grow and will take care of me when I get ready to retire. The future looks good at the shop. My house is almost clear. My insurance is in good shape. I'd like to start making some investments. This is the first time I've ever had money I didn't need on the farm. So I thought I'd like to invest in good business and get some outside income. I don't want to work all my life and 
There are always individuals and institutions with surplus funds looking for sound remunerative employment. It's our job to locate the savers who provide the funds, to judge the soundness of the investments we handle, public or private, and to bring the savers and the users together through buying and selling securities. Do institutions buy securities? One of the biggest markets we have for bonds is with life insurance companies. Part of the premiums they receive represents the savings of millions of policyholders. To a great extent, these savings are used to buy bonds from us. In this way, we provide the machinery through which safe funds become useful, productive things, capital goods. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Originating, underwriting, distributing these securities is essentially a simple but an indispensable process. As citizens of the United States, we have the privilege, the obligation, to take part in the process of underwriting America's future. And through the investment bank industry, we can invest in vitalize our industrial plants, and continue to give ourselves the steadily rising level of goods and services we all want for ourselves and for our children. This is a freedom that has made our most productive in the world. This opportunity